Hello and welcome to the first lecture in advanced programming. Today we're going to be talking about Big O, a concept that you're probably not going to be able to fully grasp today, but a concept that you're probably going to be able to understand when you come back to it later. So you might even want to skip over this video for today. That's why I'm kind of calling it Lecture Zero. It also serves as kind of an audio and video test for me, since this is the first one I'm recording from scratch. But anyway, let's dive into it. So big O notation is a way to talk about the runtime performance of our applications, of our functions, so on and so forth. We can also use big O to talk about the runtime of different things in the real world, although it always, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to apply to those situations as we're gonna see in a minute. So uh, today we're not gonna do any code because, well, it's you know just the introduction and also because it takes too long to write demonstrations of all the different big O example. So today we're mostly just going to be talking in terms of comments, but uh, from here out we'll probably be doing code for most of class. So this is kind of going to be unique. All right, so when we're talking about big O and we're talking about the runtime performance of our algorithms, we're talking about the worst case, we're talking about the average case. Uh, well, a little bit of both. Usually when we're talking about runtime performance and big O, we're talking about the worst case because we want to know what's going to happen to our program when it encounters the worst case scenario. Is it going to flop or is it going to be able to continue chugging on? Now at the same time, average performance is obviously very important to us too because that's going to be what the user sees the majority of the time. But that's not necessarily the case. If your worst case creates some kind of massive spike or drop in performance, then the user is going to notice that spike or drop in performance more than they're going to notice that the application plods along happily the rest of the time. So for example, if there's a giant spike from a worst case big O performance problem that causes your application to freeze once every five seconds for like a second or so, that's going to be very noticeable. At the same time, if your average performance is acceptable and the worst case doesn't trigger a visual freeze for the user, that's also probably going to be acceptable. All right, so let's talk about the first one. We're going to talk about constant time. Constant time is something that we very rarely encounter in the real world. It's when something takes a set amount of time to do, and generally speaking, it's going to take that amount of time to do, no matter how many items we have. When we're talking about big O, we're always thinking to, how many items do we have? What, what, is, the, what is the performance in terms of how many items we are dealing with? So an example of constant time, a bad example actually, we're going to go back to Y in a second, is administering an exam. Administering an exam. So when I give you guys an exam, or students take an exam, it takes you like an hour and 15 minutes or whatever it is that you get. And it takes you that long no matter how many people are taking the exam and no matter how many questions are on it, right? That's the amount of time that you get for it. You might finish early, you might come in later for a makeup, which obviously requires me to use more time. But let's just forget about those things for now and just think of the, the common case of everybody taking the exam in the room at the same time. That takes a set amount of time, no matter what. You're going to be done by the end of it. Um, generally, you're not going to get any extra time. And uh, again, you can finish early, but for this purpose, we're going to say that you get that constant time slot. Now, this is kind of wrong because I'm hand-waving around the fact that the more people there are taking the exam, the more net time is being consumed. So for every extra student that has to take the exam, that's another extra hour and 15 minutes of somebody's life that's being used up on it. So this is a problem that looks like it's constant time, but it's actually a problem that's something we might call in the profession, and I'm going to butcher the spelling really badly here. Wow, that was worse than I thought. Embarrassingly parallelizable. Okay. That was embarrassingly bad spellingable. Embarrassingly parallelizable, in the sense that no matter how many extra students we add, they always run in parallel. It doesn't matter if there's 10 students or 100 or 1,000. That thing's always going to take an hour and 15 minutes because it's infinitely parallelizable. Every new student you add gets to take their own exam, and uh, you can add students ad infinitum. So this is a concept that we're going to jump back to way later when talking about threads and stuff. But it demonstrates that the real world doesn't have a lot of great 
constant time applications that aren't like this, that aren't constant because they are extremely parallelizable. But in the programming world, we do have some. We have accessing an array index. In fact, I shouldn't say we have some, we have many. So accessing a value in an array by index, that takes the same amount of time, more or less, no matter how many items there are in the array. So if the array is only 10 items long and we want array of R of, uh, R of 5, that's going to take the same amount of time as R of uh, 9, whatever, however large our array is. As long as it fits into memory and it doesn't crash, accessing it is going to take roughly the same amount of time. Now, I'm using the word roughly because when we say constant time, we don't actually mean that it's constant in the sense that it's the same every time because of little fluctuations and differences in scheduling and other operating system voodoo. It's actually taking a slightly different time to access the element in the array every time but it's comparable and it doesn't scale to the amount of items that's in there. So when we say constant, we don't mean that it necessarily has to be exactly the same every time we do it. We just mean that it's like within the same ballpark. And likewise, administering an exam, like, hey, it might be an hour, it might be an hour 15, it might be two hours, but it's constant time. It's, it's one set time and it's roughly in the same ballpark. And the way that we represent this in big O notation is we say O of one. Or sometimes you'll also see O of K. K, of course, is the uh, constant. You know, usually mathematicians like to call K the, the constant, and uh, O of 1, obviously 1 is a constant value. But again, uh, maybe it's not O of 1, maybe it's uh, O of, uh, I don't know, it takes 875 seconds, or uh, O of 1 hour and uh, 15 minutes, you might say, okay, well, why don't we just say that? Why don't we say, if we know the amount of time it is, why don't we just say it's oh, of an hour and 15 minutes? Well, because computer scientists, when they talk about runtime performance, they don't, again, actually care about the amount of time that it takes. So we would still call O oh, of 1 hour and 15 minutes O oh, of 1 because it's constant and the amount of time that it takes is irrelevant to us. That's actually kind of silly if you think about it because it means that something that runs in constant time that takes... Uh, let's say one second versus something that takes one million years, same thing. We're going to call both of those O of 1. Now, clearly the one that takes a million years is performing more poorly, but it's performing consistently. It takes a million years each time. So just because something performs in constant time doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best. But when we're talking about big O notation, constant time is the gold standard. It's usually what we're going for. But it's not something that we can typically achieve outside of those few examples like accessing a value in an array. Um, let's talk about something that's constant time in the computer but not constant time in the real world. So adding two numbers together, adding two numbers together is another good example. When you're adding two numbers together, it takes you a lot less time to add 4 plus 5 than it takes to add, say, uh, whatever this number is plus whatever that number is. Um, that's pretty obvious. You have to uh, 7 plus 3, carry the 1, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the computer doesn't care. The computer adds the uh, second set of large numbers just as quickly as it adds the first set of numbers together, as long as they're smaller than the U size of the memory and whatever, a bunch of different processing constraints that we probably shouldn't go into here. But generally speaking, if we're talking about integers in Java, which is what we're going to be using here, um, 4 plus 5 takes the same amount of time as big number plus big number to calculate. So for the computer, it doesn't matter how many digits there are, and in this case n is the number of digits, it's still going to take a constant amount of time up until you get, again, to really, really big numbers. All right, so that's constant time. The one that's actually a lot easier to understand and the one that's a lot more common in the real world is linear time. Now, if administering an exam took a constant amount of time, hour and 15 or whatever, well, grading the exam, for me, is obviously going to take a linear amount of time. It's going to take uh, some time times n students in order to grade it, right? 
So the more people there are taking it, the longer it's going to take to grade, unless I have some kind of awesome automated grading suite, uh, in which case I can add that to constant time. Woohoo for automated grading, turning a linear problem into a constant one. But if I'm grading them by hand, then it's going to take me longer. The more people there are, if there's 10 students, it's not going to take me too long. If there's a million, I'm going to be doing it for the rest of my life, so on and so forth. And uh, just like with the constant time, we don't care about the value that goes here. We, we don't care about that sum time value. We're, we're only concerned that it's linear in proportion to the number of students. We don't care if it takes me 15 minutes to grade each one or an hour to grade each one. Those are functionally identical from a big O perspective. It's proportional to n. That's the thing that's important. It doesn't matter what the thing in front of the n is. So uh, one way to express this in more mathematical terms is to say we're dropping everything except the polynomial part of the equation. We're dropping all the constants out of the equation. So let's do another example. Let's say that we're going to try to figure out the sum of all the phone numbers of everybody in the classroom. Okay, so sum of all the phone numbers of everyone in the classroom. So we're saying that each student has some kind of uh, you know, phone number object. So you've got public in phone number or whatever. And uh, we want to get the sum of all of them. So you would end up writing something probably a little bit like this. You would write for um, i equals zero, i is less than students, dot length i plus plus, right? And then you'd have an array of students that presumably you made before. So students, students, okay. students, and uh, you know, here's our n. 10 or whatever, right? And uh, we're looping through and uh, we're going to add their phone numbers together. So let's see, let's add a sum, you know, and uh, sum plus equals phone number. Silly problem, but sure. Students, I, the phone number. Just ignore the fact that this is a, <laughs> a very bad example. And hopefully, oh no, auto formatter. Okay, we'll leave that. Okay, so <clears throat> ignore the fact that I didn't initialize student or any of the other mistakes that are obviously here and the fact that this is a bad program. Again, not doing good programming today. Just examples. So we looped through all of the students and we visited each one and we took their phone number. So that's linear because if there are 10 students, we did that 10 times. If there's a million students, we did that a million times and so forth. Um, so obviously that's going to be linear. But what if I asked you uh, some of all the phone numbers of everyone in the classroom? Not sure why I retyped that. And their parents. Okay. Let's go with the uh, biological parents to make this more straightforward because everyone's got just exactly two of those. All right, so some of all the phone numbers of everyone in the classroom and their biological parents. So let's just assume that everybody knows the phone number of their biological parents. How would that change? Well, okay, we, we've got the same sum there, and then we're also going to add uh, less equal students of I dot, uh, you know, mother's number, some plus equals students of I, box, father's number. Is this still linear? Uh, obviously yes, right? Obviously it is, because the only thing we've done is that we've gone from O of n versus O of 3n. And as we know, O of 3n, well, we don't care about the constant in front of the n. That's just O of n. Right, so these are the same, even though obviously the second one is going to take longer. It's slightly slower. These are both linear. So here's a catch. Um, what if I say, let's do this. Let's get the uh, let's get the sum of phone numbers for all classrooms at the university. Okay. Well. 
How many classrooms are there at the university? I don't know, but I do know that the number of classrooms is greater than the number of students per class, right? So C or whatever, the classrooms is larger than N, the number of students. So if I actually kind of tried to write this out, it would look a little bit more like this. I, I would have to say 4 int k equals 0, a is less than Rooms dot length a plus plus. So I've created a nested loop. Talk about nested loops in a second here. Well, it's obvious that this is no longer linear, even though it's very similar to the problem that I had just very recently indicated. The the problem where you're adding two extra phone numbers to each person. Well. This is just me adding more phone numbers too, but I'm adding it in such a way that it's no longer O of n. This is now O of n squared, because it is now proportional not only to the number of students, but also to the number of classrooms. And anytime you get one of these kinds of problems, that's going to be quadratic time. So quadratic time problems are like for every x, find every y kind of thing. Pretty much any problem that's structured in that way is going to be quadratic. It's going to be O of n squared. So this is actually O of n squared, which is quadratic. quadratic. Some people mistakenly call this exponential time. Sometimes mistakenly called exponential, on account of there being an exponent there, and the second power, right? But uh, exponential time is actually O of C to the N. So that's when you've got the constant on the bottom. And that's obviously a lot worse, because O of N squared only grows in proportion to square, which, of course, if you look at the problem that we just structured, the classrooms and students problem, well, as you add a classroom, it grows by the number of students, so it's basically n squared growth. Um, it might not be n squared, it might be like into the 2.5th or something, into the 2.7th, but it's growing roughly at a square rate. Whereas a real exponential function, like c to the n, well, that's going to take off extremely fast. And you don't get a lot of those in programming or in nature. The only things that really grow exponentially are things that have like a network effect, like for example, um, the spread of disease. So one person gives it to five, that person gives it to five more, and those five people all give it to five more. So that's exponential growth. Exponential growth takes off very quickly, and that's why it ends up going out of control. It's also terrible for your runtime, but again, you don't usually run into problems that are exponential in computer science, truly exponential. And when you've done so, it's probably because you've made a mistake in how you've structured it. There's not a lot of underlying problems that are exponential. So we're not going to talk about exponential much because it just doesn't come up that often. But we are going to talk about quadratic a lot. So again, any kind of nested loop is going to be quadratic. If you had uh, three nested loops, if you had uh, three nested loops, so like, uh, like 4, and then 4, and then 4 again. Well, that's probably O of, o of n to the third. And likewise, if you had 4 nested loops, that's probably O of n to the fourth. And that takes off really quickly, right? Because n to the third grows much, much faster than n squared, and n to the fourth grows much, much faster than n to the third. So if your performance is quadratic like that, then you're really in a pickle, usually. That isn't going to do well for any reasonable value of n. That doesn't mean that every time you run into a nested for loop, you're doing the wrong thing. Some problems are inherently quadratic. The one that we just talked about, going through all the classrooms and getting the sum of all the phone numbers, there's really no way to do that that isn't quadratic. 
again, it's a problem that might be parallelizable, parallelizable because we could, for example, get one person to go to each classroom, get all the student phone numbers, and then we'd come back together and take the sum of those. But if you're doing it solo, then it's going to be quadratic time, regardless of what you do. But if you can avoid quadratic time, you should. So a lot of what we're going to be doing as we talk about the different data structures and algorithms that we're going to cover is trying to avoid quadratic time and actually even trying to avoid linear time when possible. So is there something in between linear time and quadratic time? Is there something that's uh, not quite? And that brings us to log time. Log time usually represented as O of, o of log n. Now you may be wondering, what kind of things are like that? What things stop increasing in complexity as the number of items gets larger? And it's obviously pretty rare. I mean, it, it takes about the same amount of time when there's two million items as when there's a million. Uh, if you remember from your math classes what log functions look like, they start out increasing kind of exponentially, they have a pretty sharp curve at the beginning, and then they just sort of taper off so that the more items you add, they stop growing very quickly at all. They actually grow slower and slower the more items you pile on. And the best example in the real world is finding a word in the dictionary. Finding a word in the dictionary is pretty simple. Let's say you're working, looking for some word that starts with R. You might open the dictionary like three quarters of the way, approximately where you know R is, and then work from there. Or you might do something even more straightforward. You might just open the book to about the halfway point. If you landed after R, then it must be before the part where you open to. If you landed before R, then it must be after the part you've opened to. Obviously, this trick only works because dictionaries happen to be sorted. Uh, but then, if it's in, let's say, the part before where you landed, well, then you're just going to cut that bit in half again and then look at where you landed and see, okay, well, if it's before this part, then cut it in half again. If it's after this part, then cut it in half again. And you're going to find the word you're looking for in like 20 page flips at the most. And that's true whether you have the dictionary of every word that's ever been invented, or if you have a dictionary of just a few thousand words. It actually doesn't really matter. It's going to still take you some pretty low amount of flips, like single to double digits, unless you're really bad at using a dictionary, no matter how long it is. And this is called binary search which is the canonical example of a log n function, and something that we'll look into later when we look at searching. The same is also true if you're finding a page in a book, like let's say you're looking for page 50. Of course, you're not going to start at the beginning and flip through page 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, until you get to 50. No, you're going to go to roughly where you think 50 is, and then if you passed it, you're going to go back a bit, and if you... Uh, uh, are before it, then you're going to go forward a bit, and you could probably find the 50th page in a thousand page book just as fast, more or less, as you could find the 1,337,045th page in a book that has a billion pages. It still take you a pretty comparable amount of time. So those are login functions, which are Again, pretty uncommon in the real world, but are pretty common in computer science. And a lot of the time what we're trying to do is to simplify a linear or quadratic problem into a log n problem so that we can get that performance gain. But I mentioned something in between linear and quadratic because there are also problems that are n log n time. So O of n log n. <laughs> These are really rare, and you don't tend to get them very much. And the best example of that is finding n words <laughs> in the dictionary. So, doing binary search n times. Obviously, this is n log n because it's proportional to the number of words that you're looking for, and then it's proportional to the length of the dictionary, so it's kind of a gloss over because the ends are actually different items here. The first end is the number of words you're looking for, the other end is the length of the dictionary. It's not exactly the same. 
Um, but this is an example of one of those n log n problems, which are, again, pretty rare. We'll only see a couple as we go. So you don't have to keep too much of an eye out for them. And then uh, the one final one that we're going to mention is one that we very rarely see in the real world and also very rarely see in computer science, and that's factorial time, the worst of all. Factorial time, oh, of n factorial, is really bad. Obviously, as n grows, factorial time grows tremendously. There's almost nothing that's factorial time in the real world. In fact, I couldn't even think of a good example. And in computer science, it almost always means that you made a mistake or you have a problem that is inherently factorial, as many math problems are. For example, solving factorials, in which case there's really not much that you can do about it. So let's put that off until later. But all right, that's enough for now. Hope you enjoyed this big O introduction, and we'll get into the actual coding next time. Thanks for tuning in.